reach of the, I know we're in arm's reach of uh, the Yom Tif of Pesach, but nevertheless, Hashkocha has it that today we're going to discuss, in my opinion, not only something relevant to Pesach, not only something connected to Pesach, but as I see it, the most fundamental principle that we have to focus on, on Pesach and especially at the Seder. I have the good fortune to discuss the penultimate of the 13 principles of faith. And my grandfather, Rabbi Mordechai Leib Blatstein, who was a survivor of the Holocaust and he was in all the dark places, Auschwitz, Dachau, and he just passed away this year on the first day of Pesach at 106 years old. Um, and he would say that when he was in Dachau, every day he believed the Mashiach would come. And this was a Jew who for more than 10 decades awaited and longed for the coming of Mashiach. And his last words, my father said, Tati, how are you doing? How are you? His last words were, I'm waiting for Mashiach. So his first uh, yard site is coming up, and it's as we will see, it's very significant that it's on the first day of Pesach. So let's first focus on the word of this principle of faith, this article of faith. Now, I'm sure others got into it, but the, the fact that there are 13 principles of faith is completely not unanimous. Many, many Rishonim say there's no such thing as an article of faith, or there are only three articles of faith. The Rambam was a maverick in creating 13 articles of faith, and it is certainly not unanimously maintained, but we're working within the structure of the Rambam. And the 12th article of faith is as follows. I believe in complete faith. The vias HaMashiach in the coming of Mashiach. Even though it delays, I wait for him any day that he may come. And here's the question. This is the bombshell of the year. Okay, I know you've been studying these uh, principles of faith for quite a while. And I have the good fortune of this one because the wording of this article of faith is so unusual. This question is actually attributed to the Grizz, the Briskarov. Since when did the Rambam become a Toysmith and ask questions and give answers? The Rambam never asks questions. The Rambam states halacha and fact. I believe there's a God. I believe he controls the world. I believe he's non-corporeal. I believe that he rewards the righteous and punishes the wicked. The Rambam doesn't ask questions. He doesn't give answers. The Rambam's not Toysmith. If you look at the Toysmith on the Gemara, Toysmith will often say, the im toymar, and if you'll ask the following question, you could give the following answer. Or Tema, have a wonder, and Toysa says, you could give an answer. Or Viafagav, even though you may ask X, Y, and Z, Mikomakam, you could give the following interpretation. But the Rambam is a book of halacha, and especially in the articles of faith, these are just statements of fact. I believe A, I believe C, I believe D. What? All of a sudden, when it comes to the Mashiach, the Ramam has a kasha, the Ramam has a question. I believe in the coming of Messiah. Oh, but I have a question. It's taking so long. Where is he? The Ramam has a question. Oh, the answer is, I'm not sure, but I wait for him whenever he may come. Why all of a sudden does the Ramam have a question and give an answer? This is not the only place the Rambam could have asked the question, given an answer. When the Rambam stated the article of faith, that I have complete faith that God is not physical and he has no body. So why didn't the Rambam say, even though the Torah says, Yad Hashem, Eine Hashem, Oznei Hashem, the hand of God, the ears of God, the Rambam said, the answer is, Dibra Torah, Beloshan Bnei Adam, the Torah is just, giving you an allegory to help you understand the concept. Or for instance, when the Ramam expresses the article of faith, I believe with complete faith that the Rivan Shom rewards the righteous and punishes the wicked. Why doesn't the Ramam say, 
even though often it doesn't seem that way, that sometimes there's a righteous person and things are bad for him, or there's a wicked person and it's good, the Ramam should say, we believe that God in general rewards the righteous and punishes the wicked. No, the Ramam never does that. The Ramam asks no questions and he gives no answers. He merely states articles of faith. This is generally the policy of the Ramam in the Yana Chazaka and certainly in the Yud Gimel Ikrim. And all of a sudden we come to the, the article of faith of the coming of Mashiach and the Ramam has a big question. Hey, where is he? Ah, the answer is we still wait for him. Why is the Rambam deviating from his normal m- mode of phraseology? And this question is attributed to the Briskarov. And if I may, I'm going to show you a source. And if you don't like sources, don't look at it. You know, I don't hold it against me. If you like sources, then um, this is a quote from the Sefer Shari Oira and uh, Blineder. If anybody wants some of these sources after the Shir, I'll. Blinader, send it over to the good rabbi, and he could get it to you. This comes from the Sefer Shari Oira. The Shari Oira, it was written by the son-in-law of Rav Shach, and he quotes this question of the Briskarov, and the Briskarov gave the following answer. The Briskarov said, no, the Rambam asks no questions, and the Rambam gives no answers. Rather, if you look in the Rambam, in Parak Yon Aleph and Hilchas Malachim, the Rambam says as follows. Call me she'enoi mamin. But look at my cursor. If uh, anyone who doesn't believe in the Mashiach, or me she'enoi mechakel lebiyosai, or somebody who does not await his coming, loy b'shar neviim b'lvadu koifer, he's not only a heretic, in the words of the prophets, ele b'toyro uv'moish rabbeinu, he is denying the five books of Moses, and Moshe Rabbeinu himself. If we look carefully at the Rambam, the Rambam says, anyone who doesn't believe in the Mashiach and anyone who does not await his coming, says the Briskarav, what do we see from this Rambam? From the Rambam, we see that there are two components of the 12th article of faith. There are two dimensions to it. Number one, every Jew must believe that there is something called Mashiach that the day will come when God will send a king who will redeem us, a righteous king. He will take us out of Golos. He will take us out of New York. He will take us out of Atlanta. And he will bring us to the Holy Land. And this king will rebuild the temple. And this king will gather Israel from the four corners of the world. That is one aspect of this dimension of faith. Okay, so what more do I have to do? No, the Rambam says, anyone who doesn't believe in Mashiach, or anyone who doesn't await the Mashiach. Meaning, let's say say I say, yeah, I believe in the Messiah, but in the meantime, MLB started a couple days ago, and I really think the Yankees have a good shot this year, or I'm really into the Atlanta Braves. And uh, right now, I'm interested in my home, and in my my career, and my sports team, and I'm not really that uh, concerned about the Mashiach, Just, you know what, when he comes, send me a WhatsApp message and let me know when he's here. Someone who doesn't believe in the Mashiach, or the Rambam says someone who doesn't actively await his coming. The Rambam says not only is that considered improper or not noble, the Rambam actually deems such an individual a heretic, meaning someone who does not accept one of the fundamental tenets of Judaism. So the Briskarov says from this Rambam we see that the 12th article of faith is twofold. Number one, we have to believe there is a Mashiach. And number two, we have to actively await his coming. And that is very challenging. Because the Rambam says that if somebody does not believe in Mashiach or does not await his coming, not only is he a heretic in the words of the prophets, but let's look at the words of the Rambam again. He is not accepting the Mosaic Code. He's not accepting what Moshe Rabbeinu said. And the question is, where did Moshe Rabbeinu ever say anything about Mashiach? In the Chumash, it talks about Mashiach? It doesn't talk about Mashiach. Maybe there's some veiled reference. Hashem, 
that God will gather you in, but there's no reference to Mashiach per se, that the Rambam would say if somebody does not await the coming of Mashiach, they're not accepting a tenet of the Chumash of Moshe Rabbeinu. You know, if you look in Rashi, in Masech the Shabbos, Rashi says, you know, the, the Gemara tells us after 120, they're going to ask a person a, a number of questions. One of them is, see, peace of Yeshua, did you await the coming of Mashiach? Rashi says, on those words, see, peace of Yeshua, did you await the coming of Mashiach? Rashi says, divrei neviim, the words of the prophets. But now the Rambam is adding that the concept of Mashiach is not only in the prophets, it's in the Chumash. Where in Chumash does it say anything about Mashiach? So the Briskarov actually uncovers an amazing discovery that there is in fact a Pasuk that speaks about Mashiach because when the Rambam continues, the Rambam says, Bilam spoke about Mashiach. And Bilam said, Erenu Vulayata, I see him, but not now. Ashurenu, literally, I gaze at him, Vulay Karav, even though he's not close. So here, the Ramam is saying that there's a Pasuk that says, I see the Mashiach, although he's not near. I gaze at him, even though he's not close. So yes, the Pasuk is referring to the Mashiach, but where do we see from the Pasuk that I am required to await the coming of Mashiach? The Pasuk doesn't say I have to await the coming of Mashiach. And the Briskarov uncovered really something astounding from the Navi Hoshea. In the Navi Hoshea, it talks about the Mashiach and it says, I await him on the road, Bederach Ashur. Rashi is bothered that whenever it says, now simply the word Ashur in that Pasuk refers to the country of Assyria. But Rashi is bothered whenever the word Ashur appears in Tanakh, it always has a dot in the shin. There's a, a dugish in the shin. And in this word, Ashur, there's no dugish. Says Rashi in Hoshea, the word Alderech Ashur does not mean on the road to Assyria, but rather Ashur means to wait in ambush. Says Rashi, where do we see in Tanakh the word Ashur means to wait in ambush? Says Rashi, like the Pasuk in Parashas Balak, Ashurenu Veloi Karoiv which we would normally translate, I see the Mashiach and he's not close. Rashi is interpreting the Pasuk, Ashurenu, I wait in ambush for Mashiach, even though he's not close. In other words, if you want to know where in the Chumash, the Chumash says that one is required to await the coming of Mashiach, according to the Briskarov, you look at Hoshea. In Hoshea, you see the word Ashur, without a dot in the shin, means to await an ambush, like a lion. Then you apply the word, the translation of the word Ashur to the Pasuk in Balak, Ashurenu Velay Karayv. And that doesn't mean I gaze at Mashiach even though he's not close. What it means is I wait an ambush for ambush from Mashiach even though he's not close. So friends, we've now established that according to the Rambam, there are two distinct aspects of the 12th principle of faith. Number one, one is required to believe in the concept of Mashiach. And number two, one is required as a principle of faith. Now, this is very interesting because all the other principles of faith are just a belief. And now we come to the 12th principle of faith and it's not enough to believe. We now are required to await and long for. So the Rambam is saying as follows. Number one, I believe in complete faith in the coming of Mashiach. That's principle number one. And principle number two, not a question, but a statement of fact. Principle number two is, even though he's delayed, even so, I wait for him. And now I want to share with you something that I came across. Another Pasuk in Chumash which we are going to learn actually clearly enunciates this teaching. 
that we are required to believe and await in the coming of Mashiach. And this comes from one of the great Rishayim, the, the Smak, the Sefer Mitzvah Katan. And actually, the, this, uh, the Marama comes from showing you, comes from our humble Sefer on Pesach, it's called Magad Harakiah. It's uh, in chapter 14. And I'll be happy to send you this particular essay. But the Smak, as many Rishayim did, has a book of the 613 mitzvahs. We know we have a tradition that there's 613 mitzvahs and all the Rishonim struggle to try to enumerate. Okay, what exactly are the 613 mitzvahs? So the Ramam has, has his list and the Ramban has his list and the Bahag has his list and the Smak, the Sefer Mitzvahs Katan, lists the first of the 613 mitzvahs. And he says, the first of the 613 mitzvahs is to believe in God. Shanemar. Ani Hashem Aleikechem, excuse me, Anoichi Hashem Aleikecha, I am the Lord, your God, Asher Hoitzeisicha Meyaretz Mitzrayim, I took you out of Egypt. And included in that is that God controls the world and there are no other forces and God runs everything with divine providence and all the other aspects of belief in God that you would expect. And then the smack makes a 180 degree turn or a 90 degree left turn. And the smack says that the Gemara teaches us that after 120 years, they're going to ask a person, see peace, Sully Yeshua, did you await the coming of the salvation? Did you wait the Messiah? And the smack is bothered. Where in the Chumash does it say you have to believe in the coming of Mashiach? Says the smack, I am the Lord, your God, who took you out of Egypt. Meaning, and I have it in bold over here, just like I want, that you should believe in me, that I took you out of Egypt, so too I want, that you believe in me, that I am your God, and I'm destined to redeem you. That's, a, that's unbelievable. That's a shocking teaching. The Smak tells us, that part of the mitzvah of belief in God and the belief that God took us out of Egypt is believing just like he redeemed us from there, he will redeem us from our current exile. And the question is, Harsina, what does that got to do with the price of tea in China? Just because we're required to believe, just because God communicated to man, I am the Lord who took you out of Egypt. How implicit in that is that we are therefore required to believe that God will bring Mashiach? What does one have to do with the other? God took us out of Egypt 3,300 years ago. But who says, who says he could take us out of America? Maybe he only deals with Egyptians. Maybe God specializes in Egyptians. And where did the smack pull this out of? That part and parcel in the belief of the Exodus is the belief in the future redemption? So I want to share with you a very important and basic idea. And I hope that this will enhance not only our understanding of this tenet of faith, but I hope this will enhance our Yom Tov of Pesach and our appreciation for the Haggadah. Let's start off with the following question. You know, if you want to get a good idea what a book is about, there's a rule. You open up the beginning, you open up the end. And, you know, back in the day, they used to have Barnes and Noble and people had bookstores. Nowadays, there are no more, there are no more stores. You just, you get everything online. You know, in New York, everything you get online, you Uber it to your house. But back in the day, people used to go to bookstores and you would open up the book and you would turn to the beginning. Then you would turn to the end. And if you know what the beginning is about, you know what the end is about, you know basically what the book is about. You know, the Gemara and Saita says, you want to know what the Chumash is about? The beginning, God clothes Adam and Eve. God does chesed to Adam and Eve. The end, God buries Moses. God buries Moshe Rabbeinu. God does this kindness to Moshe. So it starts with chesed. It ends with chesed. This book, the Gemara Sayyidah says, is kulai chesed is entirely the chesed of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So let's apply that. Um, let's apply that method to the Haggadah Shal Pesach. The Haggadah begins, Now we're here. 
Lashana Haba, next year, Ba'ara de Yisro, we're going to be in the land of Egypt, in, the, in, in Eretz Yisrael. This year we're in Golos, next year in Jerusalem. How does the Haggadah end? The Haggadah ends, Lashana Haba be Rishalayim, next year in Jerusalem. So you would think then, by looking at the beginning of the Haggadah and the end of Haggadah, the whole, the whole Haggadah is about, you know, awaiting the Geula. And it's nothing to do with awaiting the Geula. It's not, it's not about awaiting the Geula at all. The Haggadah is about retelling, recounting the events of the Exodus. So really the beginning and the end of the Haggadah belie the essence of the, of the book. L'shan HaBab Yerushalayim has got really nothing to do with what the book's all about. So why would the Haggadah begin and end in a way that's not really capturing the essence of the Haggadah? So I want to ask you a question. We all believe Mashiach is coming. What month is he coming in? The Machlik is in the Gemara. The Gemara in Rosh Hashanah on Yud Amad Bey is going on to Yud Aleph Amad Aleph. The Gemara brings the Machlik as a dispute between Rabbi Lezer and Rabbi Yeshua. Rabbi Lezer says, that the world was created in Tishrei, the Avais were born in Tishrei, Sarah, Rivka, Sarah, Rachel, and Hannah were remembered in Tishrei. God <laughs> redeemed the Jewish people in the month of Nisan, and he's destined to redeem us in the month of Tishrei. So according to Rabbi Lezer, Mashiach's coming in Tishrei. Comes Rabbi Yeshua, and he says, no, the Avais were born in Nisan, and the Avais died in Nisan, and the Imahis were remembered in Nisan, and God redeemed us in Nisan, Benisan Nigalu, Venisan Asidan Ligal. Gula is happening in Nisan. I saw that Rav Schwab once asked the Chavetz Chaim, What does that mean? We believe Mashiach will come Bechol Yom Sheyavoy. So the Chavetz Chaim said it means in Nisan, it's like really good chance. It's like 50 50. Okay. Anybody know, how do we paskin? What's the halachic conclusion? Do we believe more likely it's coming in Tishrei? Or do we believe more likely it's coming in Nisan? So the Ran writes in his Drashos and Jewish Gimel that we paskin like Rabbi Yeshua. We always go like Rabbi Yeshua, not like Rabbi Lezer. And therefore we hold the world was created in Nisan and the redemption will occur in the month of Nisan. By the way, the Archa Shulchan likewise concludes in Simen Samach, Archa Shulchan says, we read about destroying Amalek in Adar as an introduction to the coming of Mashiach in Nisan. First, we destroy Amalek in Adar, and then we get ready for the Geula in Nisan. So we seem to hold the Geula is happening in Nisan. Now, I don't know about you, but if I order something on Amazon and they say it's coming in May, I don't know, I'm not good with that. I need to know what day, you know? I, I, don't tell me what month it's coming. I, mean, I want to know what day is it coming. Comes a Roy Keach, one of the Rishonim, one of the great Rishonim that explained the Chumet, the Siddur. And the Roy Keach says, V'ne'emar ki fada Hashem es Yaakov u'ga'aloi miyad chazak mimenu baruch ata Hashem ga'al Yisrael. Fifteen words. V'tes vav b'nisan negalu u'v'tes vav b'nisan asidun ligan. We were redeemed the first time the 15th of Nisan. We'll be redeemed the second time the 15th of Nisan. By the way, the Medrash Tanchuman Parshas Boy says explicitly, But I don't, I'm not good with that either. Because if I call my plumber and the plumber says, I'm coming on Tuesday, I tell my plumber, look, I got a life. I can't take off a day of work because you're coming to fix the faucet. Tell me when... On Tuesday, you're coming. So usually the plumber will say between 12 and uh, twelve and 2. He'll give you, right? You know the joke about it in Russia, the guy, uh, the guy bought a car. So you, in Russia, you buy a car, you put down $30,000, and they'll say, okay, in 17 years, on March 17th, the car is coming. So the guy went to the dealer. He gave him $30,000. The guy said, March 17th, in 30 years, your car is coming. So the guy says, uh, what time? So what do you know what, what time? You know what exactly you're doing? He said, yeah, I need to know what time. So he said, uh, what time? Two o'clock. So it's not a good time. The plumber's coming at two o'clock. You know? But I want to know, what time is Mashiach coming? The Sefer Haman Hig or Rishon writes that the reason why we open the door Lel Seder 
is because we are mamin. That in the merit of our going through the avoida of the seder, we have an amuna that when we open that door, Eliyahu will walk through the door during the seder and the geula will come then. Meaning, even though there is an idea that not only the month of Nisan, not only Lel, not only Pesach, but Lel Seder is opportune, predisposed for the time of the coming of the redemption. So I ask you one simple question. Wow, what a coincidence. You know, isn't that a coincidence? God redeemed us from Egypt on Nisan, and he's going to redeem us from America on Nisan. And not only that, not only did God redeem us from Egypt on the 15th of Nisan, he's going to redeem us from New York on the 15th of Nisan. And not only that, just like he redeemed us, Lel Seder, during Makas Bechorus, God's going to yank us out of Atlanta, the 15th day of Nisan, the night of the Seder. What a coincidence, right? No, this ain't any coincidence. What's the meaning of this? Is it just happens to be that God picked the same day twice? And now we come to the immortal words of the Navi, the Navi Micha, who tells us something very important. I want to see, I want you to see it inside. The Navi Micha tells us, Zayin Posik Tesva, Ki Seischa Me'eretz Mitzrayim Arenu Neflois. As I took you out of Egypt, I will perform miracles for you in the future. Which simply, this verse is just a frame of reference. God's saying, I bailed you at once, I'll do it again. However, Rabbeinu Bechaye, one of the great Rishonim, student of Ramban, the Chassam Soifer was very fond of Rabbeinu Bechaye. It's written in the introduction of the Chassam Soifer that the Chassam Soifer for 40 years, every Friday night, learned Rabbeinu Bechaye. The, the Rabbeinu B'chaye in at least six places teaches us the following principle. I'll read to you one or two. Kol hanavim maskimim pe'echad, all the prophets agree unanimously that the final redemption will be comparable and similar, uh, similar to the first redemption. Or Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar writes in his Karakemach and Chanukah, Kalbola Biyadin, we have a tradition. Sha'agu'ula ha'asida tia bedimyan gulas mitzrayim. And Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar goes on to say that just like God split the sea as we went into the Holy Land, God will split the sea for us to go back into Israel. And just like God led us through the desert the first time around, he will do that again. And what's going to come as a great surprise to you, it's just like God smote the Egyptians with 10 makos, so too God will smite our enemies with makos. And Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar goes on to say, from Tanakh, there will be a makos of blood, and there will be frogs, and there will be lice, and there will be all the makos. By the way, one of the great rabbis asked, yeah, but by two of the makos, it says they will never be again. It says by Arba, there were never locusts like that, and there never again will there be. And it says by makos bechoros, that there was a scream in Mitzrayim, never, there'll never be a scream like that again. So the Rebbe said, the Shomer Amunim Rebbe said, yeah, there are two Makos we don't need again. Arbe was not really necessary. The only reason Arbe was necessary is because the hail stopped in midair because God had to reserve it for the wicked in the future. But in the future, God will bring so much hail, he won't need the, the locust to finish off what the hail didn't destroy. And makas b'chorois, there won't be makas b'chorois in the future because the Navi says in the future, it ain't only the b'chorim that are going to go. Lo yi there won't be any survivors. So it won't be makas b'chorois, it will be makas. But there's an idea. If you think we're sitting at the Seder and we're recalling ancient history that happened 3,300 years ago and we're telling our children, kids, your great, 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 great grandfather in Egypt, he was in a tough bind and God bailed him out with 10 plagues. No, this is not about what happened in the past. This is all about a handbook 
of what's going to happen in the future. We know where we have a principle. Masay avoy simin labanim. That what happened to our forefathers is a portent, a pre-enactment of what will happen to our, to their progeny, to the descendants of the Jewish people. And we're accustomed to thinking that only applies to Sefer Bereshis, the actions of Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. No, 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 no. It continues in the book of Shemais. Every plague, every occurrence, every happening that transpired in Egypt was only dress rehearsal. It was only a practice. It was only God saying, let me see if this is working so that I, I know this is going to work. I'm going to give you two important um, illustrations of this. In the Haggadah, we say, we thank God. Thank you for all these miracles. Al-achas kama v'kama. Toiva kefula u'mechupelas. Thank you, God, that you made all these plagues. They're doubled and quadrupled. What does that mean? In what way is the plague, in what way are the plagues kefula u'mechupelas? How do they have two dimensions to them? How do they have different aspects to them? The author of the Haggadah Ma'as Anisim, the Nesivo Samishpat, explains, every Makkah was kefula u'mechupelas. It was for then, but then when God brought it, he brought it as the, the portent and the pre-enactment to be able to bring it in the future. Every maka was kefulo mechupelas. Now we understand in the Haggadah, we darshan, yemei chayecha hayomim, kol yemei chayecha halilis, And the way these psukim are explained, kol yemei chayecha oilam hazeh, to bring the days of Mashiach. Why is it that when one Tana explains it, Yemechayecha is the days, Kol Yemechayecha is the nights, he just says, Yemechayecha Hayamim. Kol Yemechayecha Halelois. He doesn't say, Lahavi Halelois. But when it comes to the opinion that Yemechayecha refers to Eilam Azeh, Kol Yemechayecha. He doesn't say, That's actually Rabbi Kivager's question on the Mishnah. And the Sefer Nitfei Mayim answers Rabbi Kivager's question. That that's exactly the point. The miracles of Mitzrayim were a dress rehearsal, a practice, to bring the days of Mashiach. Mitzrayim was... Mitzrayim, the miracles of the Exodus pale in comparison to the upcoming attractions that are in store for our people. This is what we have to tell our children, that the Haggadah is not a book of history. It's a book of future attractions, coming attractions. If a person believes that God took us out of Egypt, but doesn't use that as a motivation to await for the Mashiach, the Smak says they are not believing in the very first mitzvah in the Torah. Anoichi Hashem Eloitecha Asher Hoitzei Sicha Me'aretz Mitzrayim. That mitzvah has two parts to it. Through that command, we believe there is a God who bailed us out of Egypt. He controls the world with divine providence. But part and parcel of belief in the exodus from Egypt is the belief in the coming of Mashiach. And this is another dimension of what the Rambam means, that someone who doesn't believe and await the Mashiach is not only not believing in the words of the prophets, but not believing in the words of the Chumash itself. Where does the Chumash enunciate the principle in the belief of Mashiach? According to the Smak, I am the Lord, your God, who took you out of Egypt. And implicit in that is, if I took you out of Egypt, and that was the pre-enactment to something much bigger and better. What is that something bigger and better? And that is an imamin be'amunu shalema v'vias ha-moshiach v'yafal pisha yismamea im koze achak aloi v'chol yom she'avoi. What a wondrous approach of the smak that part of belief in the Exodus is the belief in the Messiah. You know, we always talk about the Haggadah and the author of the Haggadah, the Baal HaHaggadah, the mysterious Baal HaHaggadah. But who is it? Who wrote the Haggadah? 
doesn't really say. Here's one Haggadah that brings. The name of this Haggadah is Haggadah Semach Menachem of Rav Aroin Menachem Mendel of Nashlask that he heard from Rav Simcha Bunim of Parshiska, the progenitor of Ger, Gera Chasidus, that the author of Haggadah Shel Pesach is none other than Elio Hanavi. Now we understand why we invite him to the Seder. You know, it's only right that we, we invite the author to the Seder. A friend of mine, his name is Ezra Kohn, he suggested, you know, an author likes to uh, allude to his name in the beginning of his book. So if Elio Hanavi wrote the Haggadah, now we understand what's the first word of the Haggadah. Ha! Hanavi Eliyahu, a reference to Eliyahu Hanavi. Why would Eliyahu Hanavi write the Haggadah? What's he, what's he got to do with the exodus from Egypt? I mean, he has better books to write. He should write a book of the story of Elijah and the prophets of the Baal. Or he should write a book about, you know, what to eat at a bris milah. I mean, that, that's his thing. Eliyahu, he goes to the bris. He fights the Nevi'e Habal. Well, what business does he have with uh, the exodus from Egypt and the night of the Seder? You know, remember when Moshe Rabbeinu was asked by God, God, uh, Moshe said, uh, God says, Moshe, take them out of Egypt. Moshe says, nah, shlach no biyad tishlach, not me. Send, send the one you usually send. Tagim Yonasem ben Uziel identifies who was Moshe referring to. Moshe was referring to Elio Anavi. He's going he's gonna to redeem the Jews in the end of days. Let him redeem them now. What, what are the end of the days got to do with redeeming them now? Every job is different. But the answer is the exodus, its main purpose was as a pre-enactment and a masse of voice and a portent to the ultimate and final redemption. So Moshe said, if anyway, the whole point of this is so that Elio Novi will come in the end of days to redeem us. So let him do the beginning of the job. Why do I have to start it off? If he's going to be the closer, if he's closing the deal in the ninth inning, let him be the starting pitcher also. Let him start it off. And now we understand the significance of Elio Novi as the author of Haggadah. Because the Haggadah is not just a book recalling ancient history. The Haggadah is the handbook of the future redemption. And now we understand why, in fact, the bookends of Haggadah Shel Pesach, the, the comments that really capture the essence of the Haggadah, is Lashana Haba Birushalayim. That's what the Haggadah is all about. By remembering the Exodus, it strengthens our belief that Animamin Be'amuna Shalema Be'vias HaMashiach. Even though it's been a long time, I could wait for him. And even though, but nevertheless, thank you so much for the opportunity uh, for to share some words of Tyra with you. I want to thank the sponsors, Rabbi Aaron and Gitti Golding, for sponsoring in honor of my very dear friend. Of Gedalia Schwartz, who I think I saw on the share before, who really helps me out in uh, disseminating the shiurim, and I'm sure he'll be very happy to uh, to send you maybe some of the sources of the shir. So my appreciation goes out to Rabbi Gedalia Schwartz and to the Golding family. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rabbi Faxbrunner, for uh, giving me this opportunity again, and I wish you all a chag kosher v'sameach and a good yom tov. Thank you, Rabbi Gladstein. The Chakash Rosameach, so amazingly appropriate. Uh, that's a beautiful message to take with us to the Leila Seder at the end of this week. I mean, I, I'm going to be opening up my door with it with a with a much much more passionate open. <laughs> uh, you Thank opened you our mind, Thank opened you. our hearts to a beautiful, beautiful thought. Thank you very, very much. Chakash Rosameach. Thank you to our sponsors. Thank you to all our participants. And uh, we will see you um, after Pesach. Mitzvah Hashem. Okay. Uh, thank Rabbi you. Asking, do you are you still sticking around with us for questions, or do you have to run? I'll take two questions. I have a Gemara share nine fifteen, so we'll take two questions. Oh, that's in two minutes. Two questions in two minutes. Okay. Does anybody have a question for Rabbi Gladstein? I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>